Hello, and welcome to Success Tips Global. Today is November the 19th, 2022. My name is Everett Fori, and I'm speaking from Tsukuba, Japan. Today, it's a great pleasure for me to speak with a young but distinguished gentleman, Raynel Okain Ajete. Welcome to Success Tips Global. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm also very honored to be on the program today. Thank you very much. Okay. I understand you're in Vietnam. Yes. So, Where in Vietnam are you based? So currently I'm based in Hanoi, which is the capital of Vietnam. It's a very beautiful city. And if you ever get a chance, you should visit. Yeah. Sounds good. And how long have you been there? <laughs> very good question, because um, I've been here for quite a, a very short time. Okay. Um, I came here on the, well, it was in the middle of September. Okay. So it's barely two months. It's almost, yeah, two months now since I've been in, in Vietnam and I'm hoping to stay longer. You know, mm. if and how, how do you like it so far? Well, so far it's been a great experience. Initially, I thought it was chaotic, but mm. now I'm just realizing that I love chaos. Basically. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a very nice experience. Um, food is cheap over here. Mm. It can be very good as well. I mean, you could you could have a very good life for a little amount of money. Okay. So that's that's one thing um, which makes me want to stay here. It's really nice. Mm. And um, aside that, the people are also really amazing. Fantastic people in here. Mm. Very cool and. That's, that's what I like so far about about um, Vietnam. There are other, a list of other things, but these are the top two. Yeah. Okay. Have you tried any of the food yet? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so before coming, um, I had a lot. Of, I've heard you know people say so much about um, Vietnamese food. There's one particular um, chicken noodle soup. Okay. I don't know if you heard of it called pho, pho ga. Right. So, before coming, I was always looking forward to, you know, trying it. So the <laughs> first time I went, that was the first meal I had, and it was good. Mm. And I remember, you know, struggling with um the chopsticks because I had right. never eaten before. So you should have seen how dramatic it was. And then I had to learn. Someone was there teaching me how to use that. Mm. I've had that. I did like it. And um today, for instance, I had this meal um called is Bun Mi. Mm. So it's bread with um should I say beef? It's a kind of beef beef broth. Okay. Yeah, and then some um spice added, and it was very good. Very good. So yes, pho is my favorite. And I see a lot of people eat rice over here. And just mm. I don't eat a lot of rice. It's been just fantastic. I eat rice every day for breakfast wow. and dinner as well. <laughs> okay so now let's talk a little bit about your profession what exactly do you do um so currently i am a teacher here um in vietnamese public schools so okay. i teach in three schools at this grade six seven eight and then nine mm. and it's mainly um teaching english okay mm. and what's the experience like so far it's been good. It's been very good thanks to the company I work for. Okay. It's been very supportive um, in terms of um, giving us what we need to, to thrive in the Vietnamese in the Vietnamese context and also um, public schools, for instance. So, for instance, um, you know, it's hard managing large classrooms, especially if it's a public school. Okay. But with the program that we have at my company, they split the classrooms into smaller sizes. Oh. The teacher do not have to, you know, bed a bed in of mm -hmm. a large classroom. Plus, for every class that I teach, I have a teaching assistant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it really helps a lot. It really mm -hmm. helps so much. So I've been enjoying the experience. It's been two months already. Mm -hmm. And um, just last week, I passed my probation. Oh, wonderful. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's 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 just it's just fine. It's just amazing. Yeah, I love it. So, what do you like about the students? 
well, a lot of them are very curious. Hmm. And I would say for the the elementary school kids, I would okay. say the smartest kids. Hmm. So they are very eager to learn English hmm. for that matter. And um, I personally get to learn so much from them. Hmm. Hmm. I think I spoke to you some other time and I saw that you believe that, you know, teaching is not just about the teacher or, you know, just hmm. teaching. But then we actually get to learn. And right. the fact that while I'm teaching them English, they try to also teach me Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Oh, I say something. I try to say something in the Vietnamese. Mm. How wrong it is. They get so excited, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. To motivate me. And I'm like, oh, wow. I should be doing that for them too. Mm -hmm. So I do like the enthusiasm, you know, towards learning. That's mm. what I'm okay. about. Yeah. Mm. Well, you've not been there for long, but are there any challenges that you've faced so far? Um, not really. I wouldn't mm. say any particular troubles or you know challenges. Mm. Like I said before, my company made the whole process very smooth. Okay. So from my visa, my paperwork, my lodging or accommodation, mm. it, it was all handled by my company. Okay. It was all done. So within I think two weeks of being here, all my paperwork was sorted out. Okay had a real challenge per se but um i would say when it comes to the teaching you know i i hadn't taught in a public school before so this mm. was more of you know a first time experience okay in the very first month it was a bit challenging with um getting your materials ready going to class and all that so that might have been a bit challenging but with the support mm. from my um line manager and then the company as a whole it's been okay. a, um it, the experience has been enriching oh, okay mm. so when i just look at myself now mm -hmm. compared to who i was before i right. see the difference in terms of you know how much i've learned mm -hmm. yeah. wonderful what about transportation how do you get around oh you don't say <laughs> <laughs> you know before coming here i was scared of motorbikes mm. Mm -hmm. So when I see people riding motorbikes, I'm like, wow, they must be really courageous to be riding right. at top speeds and all that. Because I never want to have a, I never want to have an accident. So when I came here, I just realized that everyone, everyone was riding a motorbike, mm -hmm. even teenagers, kids. Wow. One or the other, either has um a moped. Mm -hmm. or so I was just wondering how that was possible. So I got to learn that if you want to survive in Vietnam, right. you, know, you need a motorbike mm -hmm. to carry around. It might even be better than, you know, having a car or anything like that. Right. So as scared as I was, one day I just decided to, you know, rent a motorbike. Okay. And then when I my neighbor, I learned how to ride a motorbike. Wow. Initially, I was like, no, I'm never going to take a motorbike because... Mm -hmm. It was dangerous and you know, all, but taking Uber or Grab each and every day, I realized that it was just draining me. It was really okay. draining what I had. So I decided to switch to motorbikes, and now I've been riding for one month. Good for you. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. Somebody might ask, where are you from? Uh, yes. <laughs> so I am originally from Ghana and I lived in Ghana until I was about 19 years old and I moved to Morocco. Yeah. Okay. So, so in, let's stay uh, in Ghana. Let's stay in Ghana for a while. Where in Ghana did you live? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in the Greater Accra region in Ghana. So I was born in Dansuman. And when I was when I was about um seven or eight years, I moved to live in Labadi, I don't know if you know that place. Mm -hmm. Labadi to Kaswa, and then by 18, I left the country. Okay. But before you left Ghana, which other places did you visit? Well, you know, I, th I think I'm one of those people who, um, you know, there's a saying in Ghana that, you know, there are some people who never travel. Mm. They are born in Accra. They will live in Accra. They get married in Accra. They will probably die in Accra. <laughs> Mm. After life, they'll probably be in a crowd. Right. I was like, oh, but then for high school, I wanted to change a bit. So I attended high school in the eastern region. Okay. 
Mm. So I lived there for three years. And I've also been to Cape Coast and then Sunyani in the north. But then that's just about it. I haven't told Ghana very much. Okay. And so let's go to Morocco. What motivated your departure to Morocco? Mm, <laughs> that's a very good question because I never had the intention to move to Morocco. Mm. But then um, my dad managed to you know, get me um, a scholarship. So there was this scholarship program sponsored by the Moroccan government in collaboration with the Ghana government as well. So um, I got this opportunity to, you know, study and then live in Morocco. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was hesitant, but then um, my dad, you know, convinced me to go because this would be a good opportunity for me as well. So I ended up finding myself in Morocco, mm -hmm. um, basically. So I did study in Morocco for three years. Okay. After which I worked there for two years, making a total of five. Okay, so which city in Morocco? I was in the capital um, okay. called Rabat. Have you heard of Rabat? Yes, yes, yes. You've been there mm -hmm. before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, and how long was the program? Um. So normally the program, well, the program was three years. Okay. So I studied in the university in the capital for three years. Hmm. Okay, and what exactly did you study? So just before I answer that, all right, okay. Normally, normally when um anglophone speaking can uh, I'm sorry, students from anglophone speaking countries arrive, right. what they usually have to do is to go through this immersion or immersion year where they have to study French. Okay. For at least six months or more. Then afterwards, they are moved to the mainstream um, Moroccan universities. Mm. So I didn't have the luxury of studying like everyone does. So okay. one, I, just, I did general arts back in Ghana in high school. So um, I was just taken to the university directly to study okay. linguistics. Mm. Plus, I just knew a bit of French. I could read French. I mm. could also understand when French is written. Okay. Home. So they just made me go straight to the university. That's okay. What. Okay. So was the course in English and French or just in English? Um, fortunately for me, the course was mainly in English. Okay. However, there were you know French and Arabic components, mm -hmm. and I really struggled. I really okay. struggled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why did you decide on this particular course? I wouldn't say I decided on it, on it per se. Okay. So, like I said, my situation was more like, let's say, I came around a time where most um, Francophone students go directly to school. So okay. When I, lived, I didn't really have much choice in choosing okay. what I wanted to do. And I then see. The course, which was in English, because they assumed um, I didn't know French, I didn't know Arabic, so I couldn't go you know to the damn to the schools directly so they just gave me the only course which was in english at the time and that sort of saved me but i also sometimes regret because it would have been a good opportunity for me to learn french okay mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. okay how did, did you get to know the local people uh, how did you communicate with them um through a series of things. So I did meet most of the locals through um, friends, friends okay. at school. And then there were others you would meet on the streets, in the mm. markets, in the marketplaces, among many other things. But communication wise, I realized that I kept met, met I kept meeting English speaking Moroccan people. Okay. That made the whole process easier. Mm. And because Moroccans speak French as well. Right. I had to learn how to speak. Mm -hmm. I was forced to speak. Right. So that also became a way for me to practice my French. So mm -hmm. I would just go to the market and then try to, you know, practice my French speaking skills over there. So I would say that, that was a rather positive experience because I never sat in a classroom to learn French. Okay. French, thanks to being forced to interact with people. Right. Mm -hmm. So what was your overall impression of Morocco after living there for so many years? 
Yes. Um, I think it's a beautiful country, first of all. Mm. A lot of nice places to see, such as Marrakesh. Um, I love Casablanca as well. And the people are very warm. When it comes to hospitality, I think they're there. Mm. Um, when it comes to work, uh, <laughs> it's not bad. And it's mm. also not a bad. So, yes, overall, I had a positive experience there. And I would definitely love to be there. Mm. for vacation yes it's a very mm. great place That's okay I'm, i understand you had a scholarship but uh, how else did you survive i didn't see that coming <laughs> <laughs> so well it was a bit difficult because even though we were receiving um stipends from the government mm. it wasn't nearly enough so okay. even you had to you know depend on the stipends you get from the Moroccan government, which was about, I think, well, it was less than $80. And this was supposed to, you know, take care of you for two months, mm -hmm. which was nearly near enough. So I, I was mainly getting support from my dad back home. Okay. Time to, you know, I was new. I didn't know what to do. I was, okay, maybe I should find um, a part-time job or something right. to help. It wasn't easy if you don't speak French or mm -hmm. Arabic. Right. Because English speaking jobs were very limited in the country. Mm. And I remember there was one time I tried to apply for a call center job and okay. I just got rejected on the spot. <laughs> Why? They wouldn't, even look, they wouldn't even look at my CV based on the fact that I'm not from the right country. So it was okay. either I was Moroccan or I came from Senegal. Mm. 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 Wasn't true for me. So I gave up on the whole idea. But in 2020, I know COVID was such a terrible thing, but it actually made a very a big turning point in my life because I got my first job. Okay. The, it was an online job. Mm -hmm. And then the pay was quite good. I started teaching mm -hmm. philosophy. Okay. Since then, I became self-sufficient and mm -hmm. I've never looked back since then. It's mm -hmm. been, it's been good. Then... Um, aside that, I also started my own um, business on okay. this project, which has grown over the years, mm. and I'm proud of it. Okay, so talk a little bit about your project. What what does it involve? Okay, so the project or our company is Aiko Afri. You know, there are a lot of Africans in the diaspora. There are a lot of people who are married to people of African descent. Mm -hmm. So one or the other, we all want that connection. But then finding resources or finding the means to reconnect with our roots mm -hmm. is not really enough. So if you look at most language learning websites and most language companies, they cater to the big languages like English, Spanish, Arabic, and all these things. But then African languages are very underrepresented, mm -hmm. especially the minority languages. So um, there came the idea we could actually provide resources or provide service where Africans or people in the diaspora mm -hmm. will connect with their roots by learning various African languages. And then we only cater for, we only really cater to African languages such as um, Yoruba. It's mm -hmm. our most, our most um, the most demanded language. Okay. So far. That's a Niger so, Nigerian language. It's spoken in Nigeria and mm -hmm. it's very much related to my native language called Ghana. Okay. So we have Yoruba, Ghana, in Zimba, and a host of other languages. So we started thanks to a group of African-American women who okay. wanted to connect with their African um, roots. Mm -hmm. There, everything just fell into place. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I remember vividly when I when we were telling people about, you know, African languages and all that, mm -hmm. most of them try to downplay mm -hmm. what we're trying to be telling us that, you know, who wants to learn an African language and all that. I mean, it's true. Most people are learning English and it's, English is an international language. Mm. However, with time, we got to realize that there's a whole demand there's mm -hmm. a whole for African languages. Right, right. And mm -hmm. we started with just three students who okay. are just our friends. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our African American um friends. Mm -hmm. And now we've got 30 students. Wow. Or 30 students. Good for you. Mm -hmm. So that's 
uh, that would say is progress. We are more than happy to also be providing this service where people get in touch or they'll get, they get in tune with their heritage. Okay. So you did graduate in Morocco. Yes, I did. And then why did you leave? <laughs> well, <laughs> so basically, uh, I did I did like how you phrased the question. Uh, <laughs> I I guess I got an offer that was too good. So I had to make the hard choice of leaving. But then it was it was a decision which was easy to make as well. Mm. Because comparing to uh, comparing what I was getting over there to what I'm getting now mm -hmm. in Morocco, I was getting three times less mm. what I received. Okay. So mm. once I just got it. I'm like, okay, I'm packing my things. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I said, the offer was too good to resist. Mm. And the company also happened to be um one that was trustworthy and then they really took care of me in barrel. So there was no looking back. Mm. So was it the company that found you or did you look for the company? I looked for it. Okay. <laughs> So there is a funny story actually. So because um initially I didn't really know Vietnam as a destination. Okay. Mm. Um I had applied for different jobs, especially one in South Korea, then there was another one in China. Mm. So I got a call back for South Korea. I had two interviews, one with a recruiter and then the owner of the center. They made an offer because they liked my CV, they liked my interview, my performance in the interview as well. Mm. However, when it was time to, you know, get a visa, mm. that's where the problem, the big problem started. So it, it appears um, I don't have the right passport to teach. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you want to teach in South Korea, you must be a native speaker, as they, speak, mm -hmm. as they say. So either you're from Canada, U.S., you know, these countries. So mm -hmm. that was, that ruled everything out for me. Okay. I started looking at alternatives. Mm. Then Vietnam was on top of the list. So mm. Mm. I applied to the company. I didn't know anything about the company there. Right. As many jobs as possible. So the company got back to me and they asked for my documents and mm. all that. So after sending them everything, they arranged an interview. Mm -hmm. And my performance in the interview was great. Mm. And the next day, I got the offer. Wow. Very fast, eh? It was mm. really fast. Mm. It was really fast. Mm. And I, I, I was very, very happy when I got that. When I told my dad, I think that was one of the, um, the day I felt <laughs> like he was so proud. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. Basically, <laughs> it, it, it was good. But, you know, now looking back, looking, looking back at this, or looking back at that, I think everything just fell in place for me. So it was good. Mm. I lost the South Korean job because okay. recently I've heard that you know South Korea there are a lot of you know issues when it comes to working in South Korea and all that, mm. especially with the companies and all that. Right. And, um, how the how things went with the first recruiter, mm -hmm. I might have found myself in a very compromising situation. So right. that didn't go through, and then I found a much better company mm. and. The company I work for actually is an international company based in the UK. Okay. Franchises or let's say branches in about 10 countries, with Vietnam being one of the oldest. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would say I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. was very okay. Lucky. So what advice would you give to people who want to study outside of their own countries? Okay. So if, 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 oh, okay, study, not work. Yeah. First study. Let's okay. talk about study first. Yeah. All right, so for study, I would say you need to know what you want to do first. Mm. Then you'll be able to pick a course that would be in line with whatever goal or vision you have in place. In, in, okay. yeah. So even though I didn't choose what I wanted to study in Morocco, mm -hmm. it ended up being what would sort of propel my career. Right. So thanks to what, what I studied in school, which was mm. English and English Linguistics, mm. I was able to get into this field of work mm. thanks to the knowledge and everything I had acquired through that. So I would say know what you want, know what you want to study first and what mm. you want to be. There, you pick a course 
do due diligence mm. and everything will fall in place. Okay. You may have answered this question already, but what advice would you give to people who want to come to Vietnam? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what you want to do. What, what would you like to do? To study? Maybe or... to work. To work, yeah. All right. For Final... people who want to work, yeah. Very. My advice would be just find a, a, a reputable company because um, I've had a lot of you know horror stories with recruiters. Sometimes they promise you a lot, and then when you come, it's not what they promise, or they try to you know shortchange you, mm. one or the other. They lowball you also. So finding a recruiter, um, a reputable company is all that matters. One that wouldn't take you through hoops or hell, basically. That's all I would say. Um, I know there are a lot of um, a lot of people that would give you promises, knowing very well that. You, you may not have the requirement because the government has put in place certain requirements required for, let's say, teachers. Okay. You must make sure that you meet these requirements before you make the move. Else, if you don't have these things and then you make the move, mm. you might, you could get what you want, right. but after you've suffered a lot. Mm. And I would say, I would say, get your qualifications as much as possible. Mm. Because that's what really matters. If you want to get a good offer and also be totally legal, get your qualifications. That's what matters. Your bachelor's degree, um, make sure you have a clean criminal record. And um, aside that, you'll also need a teaching certificate, be it a TESOL certificate or CELTA or a TFL certificate as well. That's what really matters. And then if you're not a native speaker, you're not from the US or these native English speaking countries, you would be required to, you know, take, um, how do you call it? Like an English proficiency test. Okay. So you must have at least C1. Mm -hmm. Your level must be C1 in English mm. to basically pass the government's uh, requirements. That's what I would say. But then it's really important. Okay. And what advice would you give to those who want to study African languages? It's never too late. Mm. To language and no matter how old you are it's better late than never mm -hmm. so once once you start you might realize the connection that you have and it's always a good thing to find out about who you are and where you come from okay so everyone to try to adopt an african language mm. if you don't have one Okay, now if you look at your life, you've you've achieved a certain measure of success. Maybe not everything that you want to achieve, but you've you've reached somewhere. So looking back at your life, what do you think are the characteristics or qualities that have helped you to achieve your goals so far? Okay. I would say <laughs> always yearning to learn or mm. to be better than I was. That's that's one thing which has actually propelled me because in Morocco I was working um for a company mm. that was severely underpaying me. So I didn't feel appreciated over there. So what I did was I had to be better, get mm. more qualifications. So while working, I was doing other training programs mm. at the same time to better myself. So I think this this is one of the biggest factor for me in terms of wanting to learn, wanting to become better. And I think hard work also pays, well, hard work and then also working smart, mm. that really, really helps. And patience is everything, I would say. I remember when I started, my dad was pressuring me to do so many things, but I never felt ready okay. to do these things. However, once everything fell in place for me, I just took the leap of faith. And then success also came my way. So patience and then being always ready to learn to better yourself. That's what I would say. Okay. So those are all my questions. But uh, is there anything that you've always wanted to say but may not have had the chance to say and that you want to say now? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. Um, 
I mean, it's good to have family. Mm. And don't be pressured by your family. <laughs> I know my dad is going to kill me for this. But yeah, don't let the desires of your family push you to do things you're not comfortable with. I would say that's one thing um, I've always wanted to say, especially to my family. Yes. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure for me too. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.